Currently, hospitals are reimbursed for these services under the Hospital Outpatient Perspective Payment System, HOPS, and physicians' offices are reimbursed under the less generous physician fee schedule. Since 2008, community oncology clinics have uh, seen the shift from physician office setting to the hospital out, uh, outpatient department as a result of the flawed Medicare payment policies that reimburse hospitals at higher rates than oncology clinics for it, the exact same service. Reimbursement should be equal for the same service provided to a cancer patient regardless of whether the service is delivered in the hospital outpatient uh, department or a physician's office. Because of the Affordable Care Act, there is this pressure for consolidation. And I mean, I ask myself all the time, just from a professional standpoint, is this a good thing or a bad thing? I, I come from a long line of, of, of a medical family, and our contract was always with the patient. Our advocacy was always supposed to be for the patient. If I work for the hospital, then suddenly that dynamic changes, and I'm not certain and I can't put a dollars and cents figure on there. I'm just not, I'm not, I don't sense that that necessarily is an improvement in the practice of medicine. Over the last five years, 47 community practices have started referring all of their patients uh, elsewhere for treatment. 241 oncology office locations have closed and 392 oncology groups have entered into an employment or professional services agreement with a hospital. That's a fairly staggering shift in five years. What would you attribute that significant shift toward a hospital setting? There's a lot of consolidation out there. I think the hospital's motivations come in a couple of, of varieties. There is this notion of building systems and coordinating care, which may be a good uh, motivation. There is capturing referrals. And to the extent that the Medicare and the private sector pays more when you make that jump, then there's that motivation. On the physician side, and this goes to some of what Mr. Burgess is saying, I hear both kinds of conversations, ones that are, I'm very upset by this trend and I don't want it to happen, and other physicians who say, this actually frees me up to kind of focus on care. In a, in a market economy, if the hospitals pay more for exactly the same services, it's pretty hard to argue that that isn't a significant factor. And in you this. do hear us saying that's what we're No, and I do. And I just wanted to clarify that number because I was staggered by it. Uh, an, a $1 billion increase, uh, if I heard you correctly, from that migration to the hospital setting of which $200 million is borne by the hospital, that, or excuse me, by the patient. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, and I, just to clarify, for the 66 services that we've identified, which right. may or may not encumber the ones that you're, you're referring to, uh, we think on an annual basis we're talking about a billion dollars, and, and just for round numbers, let's say the beneficiary carrying 200. So that is a significant cost increase for the patient. I think just the fact that we've pointed out the significant cost to patients, number one, not only in just dollars, but the anxiety that comes with getting in that car and driving a greater distance just to have access to care means that we ought to do something about this yesterday. The longer this goes, the more we will lose, the more patients that will be impacted out of, cost, uh, out of their pocket cost, and again, all of the anxiety and trouble uh, that is caused by greater distances is is very, very troubling. I'm very concerned about the cost issue with chemotherapy drugs, especially since the sequester went into effect. Um, we have seen a number of cancer clinics that are in our communities basically closing their doors or being bought up by, by hospitals. And many of them will cite that it has to do with the, you know, basically the Affordable Care Act is, is an issue, but then on top of it, the sequester has, has created a, a very uh, difficult situation for them to continue in private practice. One of the concerns that I frequently hear about the 340B program, it's, first of all, it's a great program, and I, I support it strongly in many instances, but we also hear that some are claiming that there's some abuses of that program where hospitals, well, some centers will purchase the drugs at discount, but then they'll sell them at the markup again. And, and get this money. Now, is that something that some of these other private clinics or physicians' offices, are they able to purchase drugs at the 340B program? Again, I'm, I'm not deep on this, given the subject of the uh, hearing. I, I didn't study down on this one, but my sense is no, that's not available to them. 
So, so this adds another issue here. I mean, what I hear frequently across the board, hospitals and physicians saying that the reimbursement rates for Medicare doesn't really cover their costs sufficiently. They complain about the, just the low reimbursement rates. But what you're telling me is that if we focus also on what, um, if, if some of them also are making money on the 340B program, and maybe this is out of your, um, your wheelhouse, but is that that's another area of disparity if there is differences between people who generally qualify versus those who may not qualify, but the hospital's still getting some 340B money out of this? To the extent that the fact set that you and I are talking about here without me doing the homework on it, yes, that would, that would be true. I think, you know, from my perspective, it's an issue of are those dollars going to save, the, you know, to, to the care that those uh, patients who, who require charity care, is, you know, is the hospital, if, if a hospital is a 340B hospital, are those dollars truly going where they are supposed to go? And, and I, there again, and certainly not ever thinking that a hospital would, would be playing games, but I think if, if there is a wide um, and, and a very gray area there, I think that, that the hospital would utilize them as they, as they need to. And I think that that might be something that, that we need to work on into the future. In the last few weeks, a report by the IMS on global on oncology tr trends, as well as other things, shows that uh, there is a different cost for Herceptin in different sites of service. That if you have a 340B hospital, oncology-based program, that the delta between what they're you know, charging and paying is such that it creates a competitive advantage relative to community onco oncologic services. Uh, any comment upon this? I, and I really apologize. I'm not deep on that. There were a couple other uh, uh, questions on this. The, the only thing that I can offer you is the Commission is aware of this issue, and I have some work going on, but it is very developmental at this stage. I haven't even taken it out in front of the Commission. Uh, so what uh, the only comfort I can give you is we're not tone deaf. We understand that that's going on. We will start looking. We are looking at it. In the current environment, hospital-based care enjoys numerous advantages over community clinics, including up to 50 percent discounts on drugs for the 340B program, tax exemptions, Medicare reimbursement for uncollectible patient responsibilities, government payments for uncompensated care, tax-deductible private contributions, and the focus of today Higher, call, higher payments for the same services. Why should we accept a system that requires the nation's most vulnerable to pay more for the exact same service in a less convenient setting? There is no reason for different payments for the same outpatient services to depend on whose name is on the door. You know, my frustration with this is exactly what you said. So one day the shade goes down and it's whatever the rate is, the next day it opens up under this new contract because it's a hospital affiliated center now and, and the price goes up and I think the number we heard was roughly 20 percent on average across all of the specialties. I mean, does that, what, what is the difference in care that that person gets from the day that the shade goes down to the day the shade goes up? What is the difference in care? What new well, standard? There, there, there's no measurable added value for those patients, and there's no uh, measurable added uh, benefit. Dr. Brooks, for the past few Congresses, I've teamed up with our Kentucky colleague, Congressman Ed Whitfield, in introducing legislation to fix a flaw in the Medicare reimbursement formula while impacting providers. This legislation is called the Prompt Pay Bill, H.R. 800, you mentioned in your testimony. It would ensure that CMS no longer uh, includes a prompt pay discount when reimbursing providers. Dr. Brooks, as we talk today about factors that's causing patients to be shifted out of the community settings to more expensive settings, what impact do you think this passage, this bill, would have on helping prevent this shift in care? And it would, in my opinion, to metaphorically say, take uh, a lot of community practices uh, off of life support. And if we were to pair it with uh, the Rogers Matsui bill and the Elmer's bill, uh, we could restore vitality uh, uh, to uh, community oncology. But uh, prompt pay would go a long way standing on its own. Okay. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the perverse uh, interpretation uh, of CMS on our Part B uh, payments, uh, they uh, decreased uh, our uh, uh, service fee for managing uh, chemotherapy and oncology offices. Uh, not by uh, 2 percent as we anticipated, 
but by 28% uh, when one does all the calculations by, because they included the entire cost of the drug. And so our, our service fee was decreased by 28%. This has caused great hardship uh, uh, in the oncology communities. Uh, and uh, even within my own U.S. Oncology Network, we have practices now in peril. And, and prior to sequestration, really, those practices were fine. Uh, so this additional blow on top of the lack of prompt pay relief and the, and, and the uh, uh, lack of site neutrality payments, I mean, CMS decreased our reimbursement for chemotherapy infusion again this year. Those, uh, those triple uh, 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 burdens are causing praxis, even in our very robust, efficient ne network, to be uh, financially imperiled. I just cannot tell you the frustration of dealing with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services trying to get them to calculate a correct arithmetic equation of the 2% reduction in the sequester of ASP plus 6. And this was the subject of a letter. Our office led it. We had a lot of people that signed on. Uh, they did, to their credit, they wrote me back, but they wrote me back to me indicating that they didn't understand uh, how to do simple arithmetic, but it makes no sense if you're going to apply an across-the-board reduction with the sequester of 2%, you would never begin with the ASP part of that equation. The ASP part of that equation is a fixed cost. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think it would be, we would all be remiss in our duties if we stand by and allow one more ca cancer patient not to be able to make travel, select not to get treatment, or their costs go up so prohibitively they can't continue treatment. I mean, shame on all of us if we can't pull this together pretty soon so that we don't lose any more of these centers. I think it's awful important we deal with this issue soon.